sometimes is an opportunity not to be missed. So uh, Rabbi Dr. Moshe Tashansky, who's going to speak tonight, uh, I, I know because uh, my wife is a first cousin. And the most important thing is that he is a member of a tremendous group Yidin that we admire greatly who are in Eretz Yisrael and who have given their lives for Torah and Am Yisrael. Talmud Chacham, who is a Rebbe in Yeshivat Cholev in Yerushalayim. And we are very, very honored to have him. So, and you have to understand that immediately from here, after Myriv, which will take place immediately after the lecture, so he, we will be driving into the airport. So he's, uh, there's a chesed that he's doing. We're very, very thankful and so happy that he could, uh, that he agreed to speak for us. Without further ado, Rabbi Dr. Moshe Tashansky. center and meeting all the people and it's a school for me to be here taking part also in all the meaningful activities they do here in the Kehila and in the Center for Return. Mishinichnas Av Matin Besimcha from the beginning of the month of Av that we just started this week are days of mourning and we are commemorating the destruction of the temple, Kurban Beis Mikdash. It's an appropriate time also to remember the modern Korban destruction of our time, the Holocaust, and may our learning together bring inspiration and add one more stone to the rebuilding of the temple. Amen. 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 My PhD dissertation, and excuse me for speaking from uh, reading my notes, but I'm used to speaking in Hebrew with a presentation. I'm speaking in English and without a presentation, so I'll do the best I can. My PhD dissertation focused on one individual, Rabbi Ephraim Oshri. Rabbi Oshri is the author of a series of books named Shelos Uchuvos Mimamakim, Question and Answers, Responses from the Deaths. My continuing research focuses on the general chuvis, the answers of the Rabbonim, of the rabbis, from the Holocaust period and on. Reflecting the halachic questions, the ruling of the rabbis, which arose during and as a result of the Holocaust. The response of literature has developed over centuries. The Torah is eternal. But the halacha, the rulings of the rabbis, recognize realistic considerations when they come to decide on the ruling, such as pikuach nefesh a state in which one is in danger and by keeping and observing the commandments of mitzvot puts him in danger then the halacha recognizes it and may tell him the chaybem you are commanded to live and you will not be considered a sin if you don't keep the commandment and it's more important to live 
The halacha, as I said, recognizes these realistic considerations, and therefore the answers of the Rabbanim somewhat reflect the historical reality of the generation and can be a source of learning about the historical period. The tshuva's answers from the Holocaust are unique. The rulings of the rabbis were often given in extremely difficult situations. The rulings were given in short time frames, sometimes on the spot. They had no option of looking up sources usually, looking up books, or consulting with other rabbis. Also often it wasn't necessarily the rabbis who ordinarily would have dealt with such matters. Life and death situations offer, often are matters that are presented to Dolei Israel, to those who are considered to be the leading rabbis of the generation. And sometimes whoever it was in the time and place, he had to reach a ruling and instruct the people who are asking him and give the answer. As I said, very difficult issues dealing with life and death situations. The complexity of various situations during the Holocaust can be represented by the following example. In the early 1970s, three rabbis, among them was a very famed rabbi, the Minchas Yitzchak, Rabbi Yitzchak Yaakov Weiss, he was a rabbi in Hungary before and during the Holocaust. He survived, then he was a rabbi in London and a leading rabbi in Jerusalem. Received the following question. <coughs> in one of the ghettos in Poland, as in other places, the Nazis issued a command that all fur materials must be turned over to them. Now three of the Jewish elders were appointed as responsible for the fulfillment of the command, meaning they would be executed if the command was not totally fulfilled. A few days after the deadline passed, the deadline that the Germans issued, a single Jew was found with a fur hat in his possession. He was executed immediately. The three elders were called forward in front of everyone. The first two were brutally beaten until they died. When turning to the third man to be executed, the Nazi saw a very tense young man in the front of the crowd he realized that he was the elder man's son. The young man had a gold watch on his arm, and the Nazi, surprisingly, instead of saying, just give me the watch, offered him a deal. If you give me the gold watch, I will shoot your father in the head and spare him the brutal death. The young man did not hesitate, turned over the watch, and the Nazi kept his word and shot the father to death. Was this an act of chesed, of helping and aiding his father, or was it a sin, a roundabout way of hastening the father's death? The son had lived with a heavy conscience and with deep guilt feelings for over 25 years. The question was asked in the early 70s, 25 years after liberation. There is strong reason to doubt he told anyone about the tragic event. It may very well be that the only one who the son disclosed his secret to was the rabbi as part of seeking repentance. The tshuva given may be the only record of this incident. Rabbi Weiss ruled that he definitely meant to do good and to aid his father, save him from the brutal death. He need not feel guilty of sin. He should do tzedakah, give charity in memory of his father but no need for more than that. Alongside the uniqueness and advantages of the response of literature, the answer is given by the Rabbonim, as a historic source, we have to point out its clear disadvantages in all attempts to learn historical details. The answers were definitely written as a halachic discussion, not as a historical source. Thus, many of the answers lack vital historical details, names of people, places, dates, etc. Sometimes they were left out because they were not viewed important for the rabbinical discussion, and sometimes purposely in order not to embarrass the people involved. Often we cannot know clearly the historical background, we can only guess. It is worth noting that a disc was put out by a machon in Eretz Royal that collected together 2,000 answers and various sources from the Holocaust period. 
Now, I would like to speak more specifically. I gave out the page because I don't have the presentation. I gave out the page just so that you can follow the framework of the lecture. Now, I came, I flew in from Eretz Israel last week because I came actually for the premiere showing of a movie by the name of Hidden, telling the story of Jewish children given to non-Jews to be hidden during the Holocaust. The movie was put out by a, an organization called Project Witness, and they held also a seminar over the last three days, a seminar for teachers, and I was invited to come and speak. I came in to speak there, and I was asked to speak more specifically about the topic of hiding the children. Rabbi Ephraim Oshri, who I did my research on, was born in Kopishuk, Lithuania in 1908, was a student in the Slobodka Yeshiva in Lithuania, in Kavno, before the war. He was an elder Talmud, an older, one of the students, an older student in his early 30s. He received his rabbinical ordination from the Rashi Yeshiva in 1939. Together with the Jews of Kovno, he was imprisoned in the Kovno ghetto during the three-year Nazi occupation of Lithuania from June 9, 1941 to July 1944. He was liberated by the Russian army. After the war, he published his monumental work, Sheilos Uchuvos Mimamakim, Questions and Answers, Responses from the Depth, five volumes, published between 1959 to 1979, containing 112 halachic rulings that he gave during the Holocaust and after the Holocaust, dealing with impl implications of the Holocaust after liberation. In volume five, question number nine, and the abbreviated one volume English translation of his book, it's question 63, he writes the following. Now Rabbi Oshri's writings, because they were translated to English, so I could photocopy them, and they're on the back side of the sheet that I gave out. I will not be quoting it fully, but when I'm mentioning his uh, answers, you can see it also on the back. Before the Germans carried out their Kinderaktion, an action against the children, to annihilate the Jewish children in the Kovno ghetto on the 3rd and 4th of Nisan, Tafshim Dalid, March 1944, word of the impending action got out. The word got out because in the neighboring Shavli ghetto, the Nazis conducted a similar kinderaktion in November 43. And the Jews of Kovno figured that it was just a question of time until the same decree would reach them too. Rabbi Oshri continues, mothers and fathers knowing that the accursed murderers were planning to kill Jewish children sought every conceivable way to get their children out of the ghetto. One way was to acquire a birth certificate that showed the child had been born to non-Jewish parents, and then to place this certificate and the wrappings around the infant. The baby then would be left on the steps of a Gentile orphanage or church. Some Jews decided to hand their children over to Gentile friends to be hidden until after the war with the stipulation that if the parents were still alive after the war, the children would be returned to them. Others wanted to save their children so badly that they were even willing to hand them over to priests, although it meant that the children would not be raised as Jews. I was asked if the halacha permitted such actions." End of quote. As Rabbi Oshri presents the question, it is, real, it is clearly related to worshipping idols, which is one of the three grave isurim, things that are forbidden to do, together with murder and adultery, for which the known din the command is, the ruling is, Yareg Bali Avo. We are commanded to show our Mesirus Nefesh, devotion towards Hashem, and the mitzvahs, and be prepared to die. Rabbi Yashri does not mention the name of any individual who presented him with the question, and does not list a total number of the Jews who asked this question. But we can bring somewhat proof of how much the Frum religious parents were troubled by this question from the book published in 2011, Smuggled in Potato Sacks. Fifty stories of the hidden children of the Kaunas Kovno Ghetto. Reading through the various stories of those 50 children, describing their parents' home, in the case of those who knew who their parents were and had memories of them, 
and the home of their non-Jewish adoptive parents, one common denominator is found. Not one of those 50 children described that they were born to Shomer Shabbos parents. On the contrary, some emphasized that their parents were not religious, not observant, and did not care to which religion their children would belong. For a religious parent, it is definitely a very difficult decision to choose between risking his child's life and risking his child's Jewish soul. Can we assume that religious parents did not entrust their dear ones with non-Jews? <coughs> Absolutely not. There are known cases of religious parents, including rabbinical families, which did so. Among them, Adina Sher, the granddaughter of Rabbi Isaac Sher, the Rosh Hashiva of Slobodka, who she herself was hidden by non-Jews. But we can assume that all who did so had very strong doubts, and many asked for rabbinical guidance on this grave decision. Was the parents' worry justified? Absolutely. It is clearly impossible to provide exact statistics, but I can quote one research held in Holland examining close to 100 children hidden there by non-Jews. While hiding, approximately 30% were pressured to go to church or behave as Christians, either for missionary reasons or as part of their camouflage. Seven were baptized. Six stayed with their adopting families after the war, three of which continued to behave as devoted Christians. A researcher can claim that, considering the circumstances, three is a relatively surprising low number, but in the eyes of a religious observant Jew, it is definitely three too many. Considering that the research was held 50 years after liberation, among those who were willing to cooperate, we can assume that the actual number of children lost to the Jewish nation in Holland at the time is definitely higher. In his ruling, Rabbi Oshri differentiated between giving the children to priests and Christian clergymen and giving them to laymen who are personal acquaintances. As he writes, I ruled that parents might not give away their infant children to priests. And his reasoning for this ruling, he explains, I will go a little bit into the rabbinical discussion, just the guidelines. He explains that the priests have a definite missionary motive. And he adds a very interesting point. Rabbi Oshri writes that the basic well-known ruling is that a young child before his bar or bat mitzvah, they are not obligated to observe the commandments. So why should they be denied being saved by priests? Furthermore, he explains that a youngster is obligated to do the rulings only as a command of the sages, as part of the ruling of chinuch, education. Now the idea of chinuch and education is practice, creating a habit that will show the way in the future. But there is one mitzvah in which there is no opportunity to practice because it's a one-time deed. And that is the mitzvah of Kiddush Hashem, meaning dying, sanctifying God. You can die only once. There is no place for practice. Therefore, youngsters are not obligated, even as a commandment of the sages. But Rabbi Oshri continues and explains that in this unique mitzvah of Kiddush Hashem, dying, sanctifying God, Although youngsters are not obligated to fulfill it, if they do fulfill the mitzvah, they are being fulfilling it on the level of the Torah itself. The original command, not on the level of what the sages said to do. Rabbi Yoshri brings proof from the story about Hannah and her seven sons who objected the ruler's demand to worship Avodah Zarah, to worship idols. According to the version in Midrash Eicha, one of the sources, the youngest child was nursed by his mother before marching forward to face the ruler. He was obviously a youngster. He and his brothers are presented by the sages as Jewish martyrs who set an example for generations. 
There is another proof he brings from the story brought in the Gemara in Gitin, Dafnon Zayn, about 400 children who were on a ship being taken to captivity, and knowing what they were expected of, they decided to commit suicide and to jump into the sea. Now they are also presented as martyrs. If a youngster cannot fulfill the command of Kiddush Hashem, dying sanctifying God, on the level of the Torah, and there is no option of chinuch, education, with Rabbanon from the, from the law of the sages, why isn't this considered a suicide? Why are they presented as martyrs? From these cases, Rabbi Yoshri learned that a youngster, although not being obligated, he is not excluded from fulfilling this specific command, this specific mitzvah of Kiddush Hashem, on the level of the Torah, and that's why he ruled not to hand the children over to priests. Rabbi Yoshri continues his ruling, and I'm quoting again, as to people handing over their children to Gentile friends or neighbors, after the war to be returned to their real parents, with life at stake, one must follow the lenient alternative. If the children were handed over to the Germans, they would surely be killed. But if they were handed over to the Gentiles, they stood a chance of remaining alive. It was also conceivable that the parents would survive. Even if the parents did not survive, it was possible that the Gentiles would return the children to Jewish institutions after the war. I ruled that we might be lenient and allow the anguished parents to hand over their children to Gentile laymen in the hope that after the war they would indeed be returned to the Jewish people. After being liberated, by the Russian army. Rabbi Oshri and others headed out and searched for those hidden young children and tried desperately to return them to Jewish hands. Dozens were returned, but it was not an easy task. Sometimes the Gentiles objected and had to be dealt with harshly. Some cases were dealt with in local courts, and in some cases the children were strongly attached to their adopting parents, some of them not knowing anything else and did not want to leave. In Lithuania, two Jewish men were murdered by Lithuanian fascists while searching for hidden children after liberation. Hashem Yikom Damam, may God avenge their blood. Rabbi Oshri elaborates and tells the story of one individual child, Yuda Edelman, whose story can be an example of how complex the situation was even after liberation. Quote, when his real mother had given him over to the Christian woman, she had given him a note that read, My child, I am leaving you forever. You are a Jew and remain a Jew. Better to die as a Jew than to live as a non-Jew. The situation was very delicate. Every day the woman came to the community and asked for something for the child. We did our best to provide for him. Eventually, thanks to the boy's aunt in the United States, Rebetzin Soloveitchik of Spring Valley, New York, the boy was transferred to her custody." End of quote. Now more about this case can be learned from the story of Pesach Yusulevich, one of those 50 children smuggled out of the Kovno ghetto as listed in the book Smuggled in Potato Sacks that I mentioned earlier. Pesach described that when retreating from Kovno, the Germans took his mother together with the other Jews and brought them to forced labor camps in Germany. I have to realize that some Jews tried to hide when the Nazis were retreating and the Soviet army was nearing them. Most of them did not survive because the Nazis, they were hiding in bunkers under the ground and the Nazis just burned the ghetto completely. The ghetto consisted of all wooden buildings, wooden shacks, and whoever was hiding there was burnt and or suffocated. Rabbi Oshri survived because together with a group of a few dozen people, there were three cement buildings in the ghetto of Kovno. Under one of them, there was a bunker in which Rabbi Oshri and those dozens of people were hiding. The cement building could not be burnt down, it was blown up. They felt the ground above them moving, they were afraid that the ceiling will fall in on them, they would suffocate, but it stood and they were liberated. Now, even the parents who were alive of these children, most of them were in Germany in the concentration camps because they, were, they retreated together with the Nazis. So those few people who did, who were liberated in Kavno, 
and the responsibility to try and return the other kids. Pesach Yusulevich continues his description. When retreating from Kovna, the Germans took his mother together with other Jews and brought them to forced labor camps in Germany. In the camp, she was with a distant relative, also from Kovna, who also hid her son with non-Jews. The son's name was Yehuda Edelman. Both women promised each other that the one to survive would do everything possible to save the other one's child. Pesach's mother returned. Yehuda's mother perished. Pesach's mother was eager to fulfill her commitment and approach the adoptive mother. She in return demanded a huge sum of money, 8,000 rubles. Pesach's mother had to sell their house in order to pay off the Gentile woman. Now Pesach's mother had Pesach to take care of and also a daughter. She had no husband, he was killed. She had to worry about her two young ones and she sold her house just to fulfill the commitment to her friend. After making contact with the aunt Revitzin Soloveitchik in New York, Yuda was sent to the United States. But the troubles did not end yet. Yuda did not arrive in the States. Only after months was he located in an orphanage in Prague and eventually reached his aunt and uncle. I spoke to Rabbi Yuda a few years ago. He claimed to remember nothing from that period. I searched for additional answers of Rabbanim from additional rabbinim dealing directly with this question of passing young children to non-Jews, but in the response to literature I found none. I could only mention that there is a book by Mrs. Lichtenstein, she's the director of Hamodia newspaper, and she's also the head of Project Witness, which is very active in commemorating the Holocaust, and in her book she writes that Rebetzin Shulman of the Kovno Ghetto, daughter of Rabbi Isaac Sher, the Rosh Hashiv of Slobodka, was active in hiding children by non-Jews, among them her niece and daughter, and she got a ruling allowing her to do so from the Dvar of Rome, Rabbi Avram Shapiro, the Rabbi of Kovno, who died in the ghetto early in 1943. An additional question had to be dealt with at the time. Was it permissible to obtain a baptismal certificate? Now this question was relevant not only for youngsters, but for grown-ups as well, seeking <coughs> hiding by using forged documents. Rabbi Yisachar Shlomo Teichta was born in Hungary in 1885, was a famed rabbi before the war, acting as a rabbi in Slovakia. In 1942, the deportation of Jews from Nazi-controlled Slovakia to the death camps began. Rabbi Teichta escaped with his family to Hungary, which was independent at the time. When the Nazis took over Hungary in 1944 and the deportations from there began, he escaped back to Slovakia. But there he was caught and sent to Auschwitz. He was murdered in Auschwitz or on the way to Mauthausen labor concentration camp. Rabbi Teichtel was presented with the question regarding the purchase of a tofshein, a baptismal certificate, while he was still acting rabbi in Piestin in Slovakia. The question was sent from neighboring Preshburg, Bratislava. They were under a puppet Slovakian regime cooperating with Nazi Germany. It became popular to purchase baptismal certificates, and the Preshburg, based in the rabbis, ruled that all those who purchased such documents would be denied aliyahs being called up to the Torah reading. Rabbi Teichel himself ruled that such documents should not be used by Jews. Yareg Vali Avol, you should die and not do such a thing. But those who did not overcome the temptation and had the certificate <coughs> should be considered anusim, ones who are acting without will, with no choice, and should not be denied being called up to the Torah. It's interesting that in the continuation of the same source, Rabbi Teichel was tending to rule that it was permissible to forge a passport by adding the letters RC, stating that the holder of the document was Roman Catholic. He suggested that while adding those letters, one think of the similar Hebrew letters, Reish, Kuf, RC, and a pasuk, a verse from the Bible remembering Hal Sinai. Rak yishamer lecha ushmor nafshecha meod, pen tishkach et advarim asher oenecha, we should remember Har Sinai and accepting the Torah. Now, why is one document permitted 
forging the passport. And the other, the baptismal certificate, is not. Now we can't answer that with the passport you claim to be a born Christian, while with the baptismal certificate you're admitting being a born Jew who converted to their religion. We can't answer that because baptismal certificates are obtained also by born Christians who are baptized. Considering the Nazis' approach that Jews who converted were nevertheless Jews, both the passport and the baptismal certificate used by Jews during the Holocaust were meant to show that their bearer was a born Christian. Seemingly the difference between the baptismal certificate and adding RC to one's passport is that the passport is a civil document with no clear religious significance, while the baptismal certificate has a clear religious nature. I examined several baptismal certificates used by Jews during the Holocaust period in the Yad Vashem archive in Yerushalayim, and they usually contained a clear conspicuous stamp with the symbol of the church. I can add that this ruling of Rabbi Taichto was quoted in a book by the name of Yerushat Pleita, published in Budapest in 1946, immediately after liberation, bringing answers of Hungarian rabbis who were murdered during the Holocaust, and this is probably the first publication of answers from the Holocaust period. The issue of hidden children had consequences and raised questions also after the war. I will mention briefly just a few examples. Was it permissible to enter monasteries and churches seeking Jewish hidden children after the war? Rabbi Oshri ruled that it was allowed. Years after the war, a man who was hidden by non-Jews was approached by an old-time neighbor of his who told him that he remembers being in his Pidyon Haben when a firstborn boy is born, so there's a ceremony of Pidyon Haben, and he told him, I remember, so you were the firstborn. Now there's a significance to that. Was this man obligated upon this testimony to start acting as a Bechor, a firstborn, and then he has to fast Erev Pesach before the Seder. Rabbi Bezalel Stern, who was born in Slovakia in 1911, survived the war and after liberation was a Rav in Melbourne, Vienna, and Yerushalayim, and he ruled that the testimony of one witness was not enough to create such an obligation. A girl hidden by Gentiles returned to Judaism years after the war and later found a wonderful shadow. Rabbi Chanuch Dov Padova was born in Galicia in 1910, served as a rabbi in Vienna when the Nazis entered Austria and miraculously escaped with his family to Israel. Later he served as a rabbi in London. He ruled that based on the details of her specific case, there was no doubt regarding her Jewish roots and there was no need for any process of gerus of conversion. Now obviously not only life and death situations were presented to the Rabbanim and the devotion of the Israel nation to continue observing the mitzvahs during the terrible agony of the Holocaust was put to test on a daily basis. I would like to present two issues, I don't know if we'll have time for two, we'll see, you'll tell me when to stop. As an example, keeping kosher and Shabbos. Each one of these issues raised numerous questions, and I will present only a few examples. Shortly after Hitler came to power in Nazi Germany in 1933, a decree was issued prohibiting Jewish shechita, the Jewish slaughtering of the animals that allows the eating, claiming that it was an inhuman way of treating animals. Later, the Nazis prohibited also the import and sale of kosher meat, shechted outside Germany. They demanded that the animals be stunned by an electric shock before Shechita. The option raised the concern that the electric shock may cause illness to the animal and define it as what's called in the Halakha Treifa, disqualifying the Shechita. Rabbi Yechiel Yaakov Weinberg was asked to examine the matter. Rabbi Weinberg originated in Eastern Europe and studied in the Lithuanian yeshivas. He reached Berlin for medical treatment and stayed there becoming the head of Beit HaMidrash Rabbanim of Berlin. During the Holocaust he was in the Warsaw Ghetto for some time and later he was imprisoned by the Nazis together with Russian prisoners of war. That's how he survived the Nazi persecution of the Jews. Rabbi Weinberg studied the matter thoroughly in pre-war Germany and wrote long conclusions 
which turned out to form a book, one volume of a series, Responsa Sridayesh. He claimed that although it may be possible to permit the electric shock, the electric stunning before Shrita, he wrote that it is clear to him that Gdola Israel, the leading rabbis of the generation, would not allow any change in the customary manner of Shrita, of the slaughtering, and therefore he considers his conclusions a mere theoretical discussion. He added, may the filthy Nazi regime and thousands similar to them part from this world and our holy religion stand eternal. As the war broke out in 1939 and Jews started suffering from starvation in ghettos and camps, a question repeated itself and was presented to several rabbis. Rabbi Yehoshua Moshe Aronson was the rabbi of Sanik in Poland when the war broke out. At first he fled, leaving his wife and children behind, thinking that the Nazis will divert, direct their abuse towards the Rabbanim and not harm women and children. Realizing his mistake, he returned to Sanik, from where he was taken in March 42, together with other men, to the Kunin forced labor camp. The conditions there were unbearable, and of 1,200 Jews who were imprisoned there, only 48 were still alive a year and a half later when the camp was shut down by the Nazis in August 43. They were sent to Auschwitz. Rabbi Aronson survived Auschwitz and the Death March and was liberated in 45 in the area of Theresienstadt in Czechoslovakia. While in the Kunin labor camp suffering starvation, Rabbi Aronson was faced with the question of, deny, of defining pikuach nefesh, a state of danger to one's life. Was one allowed to eat the trafe, the non-kosher starvation portions the Nazis provided only when one felt terribly weak on the verge of dying? Or should one eat those portions immediately, figuring that avoiding eating them will without doubt lead to severe weakness and death? Seeing that many men were hesitant to eat, Rabbi Aronson gave a clear public ruling, and in front of his fellow inmates, he took a spoonful of the tray soup, the non-kosher soup, blessed shehakol nihiya bitvaro, everything is created upon the word of God, and ate the soup. He explained the meaning of the bracha shehakol, everything coming upon us is from the Almighty, and we are commanded to make an effort to continue living. A similar question was presented to Rabbi Oshri in Kovno, and he gave the same ruling, claiming that also Rabbi Shapiro, the rabbi of Kovno, the rabbi of the city, allowed the immediate eating. But some men were more strict upon themselves and kept away from the non-kosher food. It is interesting to point out that a rabbi by the name of Yitzchak Elchanan Gibraltar, who was in his early teens while imprisoned in the Kovno ghetto, survived the war, writes that his older brother was weakened by the forced labor and asked Rabbi Shapiro directly if he can eat the non-kosher food. Rabbi Gibraltar claims that Rabbi Shapiro asked his brother his name and background and later said that although he did allow the immediate eating of the tray food, a son of such an important family and four-year student of a famed Wilkomir Yeshiva is required to a higher level of devotion and therefore he should not eat unless he feels extreme weakness. Now the topic of kashrus, the food, kosher food, followed Rabbi Aronson also after liberation. When nominated president of Agudasa Rabbanim, the committee of rabbis of the displaced persons camps in Austria, he gave a sermon in which he said the following, my body became impure, tameh, do the eating, the non-kosher. And therefore I decided a number of times not to accept anymore a rabbinical post. But I alone stand. Of 200 rabbis who participated in the conference of rabbis in the Warsaw Ghetto, organized by the joint, the JDC, Jewish Distribution Committee, in 1940, I am the only survivor. If other rabbinim will come forth who did not eat the treif, the non-kosher, I will immediately resign and hand the nomination over. Many questions were raised concerning Shabbos. 
Rabbi Aronson mentions that two days before the outbreak of the war, he was asked by a Mr. D.K. if it was permissible to drive on his motorcycle on Shabbos in order to notify the local police about two German spies seen in the area. Rabbi Aronson encouraged him to do so, viewing it as pikuach nefesh, danger to our souls. Reading the tshuva, the answer, I found it somewhat surprising that two days before the German attack that took Poland by surprise, two German spies were identified by seemingly plain folk. Furthermore, the war broke out on September 1st, 1939, which was a Friday, meaning that two days before it was a Wednesday. It seems that Rabbi Aronson is referring to the stage in which the Germans reached the specific area of Sanik, located in the south, south, southeast area of Poland, and not the general invasion of Poland. Have time. I would like to present two additional questions, asked under Hungarian rule. Rabbi Yohanan Steif, a rabbi in Budapest between the world wars. Rabbi Yoel Teitelbaum, known as the Satmer Rov, settled in the town of Satmer in 1934, when under Romanian rule. But in, in June 1940, Satmer, as part of northern Transylvania, was transferred to Hungarian rule under Nazi pressure. Both rabbis were saved on the Kastner train, which left Hungary in June 1944, after the country was taken over by the Germans in March. Until March 44, Hungary was independent relatively safe for the Jews, although the Hungarian leadership did cooperate with the Germans and sent Hungarian troops to aid the, Naz to aid the Nazis when invading Russia in June 1941. Starting in 1938, anti-Semitic laws were passed in Hungary, limiting the Jewish economic possibilities. From 1939, Jewish men were drafted to special labor battalions aiding the Hungarian army and various labor needed. Over a period of four years, until Hungary was taken over by the Germans, 42,000 Jewish men perished in those brutal slave battalions, also called Munkataber. Rabbi Taitogan was asked about a decree forcing all store owners to keep them open on Shabbos. Now, no date appears in his ruling, but a similar question discussed by Rabbi Steif mentions the date being the end of 1942. We can figure that Rabbi Teitelbaum dealt with the matter approximately the same time, 1942, 1943, when Hungary was independent, but cooperating with the Germans. Rabbi Teitelbaum discusses the basic ruling. Should the situation be considered what's called in the halacha, what's called by the rabbis, a shat gzeira, shat shmad, meaning it is a special, unique time in which one must be willing to die for all the commandments and all the Jewish customs, including even what the Gemara calls Arketa de Nesana, the shoelace. That's what appears in the Gemara in Sanhedrin da Feindale. This is, of course, different than the so-called ordinary times, or if we can call them normal times, in which one must be willing to die only for the three gravy surim we mentioned before, murder, adultery and worshiping <coughs> idols. Now Rabbi Teitelbaum brings a few reasons why it cannot be defined as Shat Shmad. It's not defined as that special time. It's, it's the so-called normal circumstances, as much as we can consider them normal, for two reasons. A, the ruling was towards all store owners. It wasn't specifically towards the Jews. Another reason is that the Jews were not forced to be present. They could hire non-Jews to do the work instead of them on Shabbat. Therefore, it cannot be considered a religious ruling with a religious significance, Shat Shmad in Zaira against the Jews. On the other hand, Rabbi Teitelbaum argued that although it is not a Yahareg Vali Avol, something that we should die for, and although if all Jewish store owners lose their permits because they cannot afford hiring non-Jews, it can lead to a state of danger to their lives. But, it's a very, but it is a very serious matter to allow Chilul Shabbos to not keep the laws of Shabbat for financial profit, and he was afraid of the future implications after the decree was canceled. Therefore, he did not issue a clear decision and left it a prayer that the decree be canceled. I would like to point out that a similar discussion appears regarding Kashrus, 
Rabbi Weinberg, we mentioned it before, he writes that it was not Yareg Val Yavol, something we should die for, because the Germans did not force the Jews to eat treif, to eat non-kosher. They merely issued a decree prohibiting kosher meat as part of their campaign against the Jews, but not necessarily against Judaism. Also in the camps, the Germans supplied the non-kosher starvation portions, leaving the Jews in a situation of danger to their lives. But the Germans did not force the eating. Therefore, it was not shachmad, which we mentioned before, and the rabbis could permit the eating, as we mentioned, Rabbi Aronson's ruling. Can I, I would. Can I just say one thing on, on that shashmat? How can they call it a shashmat? Because they would have killed you. They, they killed you even if you were shmat. The Germans killed, killed Jews even if they were shmat. How can you call it shashmat? That's a very good point. On the other hand, they definitely desecrated shuls and acted against religious symbols, and therefore it's hard. And some of the historians claim that it was not exactly clear cut, but. You are right, and the general ruling of the Rabbanim was not to consider the Holocaust Shachmad. And therefore the rulings were usually lenient. But I can say that there are two unique answers, one by Rabbi Aronson, one by Rabbi Oshri, in which they define specific situations, Shachmad, and that of course needs additional explanation, not for now. Rabbi Steif was faced with another question. The full historical details do not appear, but from the information given, we can make out the following. A man in Hungary was afraid he would be drafted to one of the brutal slave work battalions and sent away. He had an option of accepting a clerical or similar job working for the government, hoping that it would keep him in his town with special benefits and not be assigned to the work groups. The drawback was that the position included working on Shabbos, and Rabbi Steif examined the case thoroughly on the one hand, even a doubt of pikuach nefesh, danger to one life, is doche Shabbat. We are not obligated to observe the Shabbos under such circumstances. But on the other hand, in this case, the man was initiating working on Shabbos before the actual danger reached him. And also there was no guarantee that his hope that the job he was accepting would save him from being sent away, would prove itself fruitful. The tshuva, the answer as printed in front of us is not complete and Rabbi Steyer's conclusion does not appear. I would like to add one more last question. Presented to Rabbi Oshri. The most difficult labor group in the Kovno Ghetto was the group building an airstrip in the area. The work there included a march of a few miles in each direction and a 12-hour work shift that, in, that carrying metal rods and cement sacks and paving the area. A man enslaved in that work group had an option of switching to a much easier task, working in the ghetto kitchen. Now that would also give him access to additional food he was definitely eager for. The man said that he was hesitant to switch to the easier job because it included cooking on Shabbos. Now by Oshri's answer was that since he was being forced to be working on Shabbos at both job sites, there was no reason not to switch. Now, reading this discussion, we have to try and understand what was the basis of the question. What we call in the rabbinical learning, what was the Hava Amina? What did he think? The work building the airstrip definitely including, included work on Shabbos on the highest level of definition of work, Melachot Mideolaita. The man working there worked also on Shabbos. Obviously, he knew that being forced to work in a situation of danger to one's life is allowed. Why would he think that forced work cooking in the kitchen may be forbidden? I can assume that the man's thought was that he was definitely forced to work in the airstrip, and therefore he is anus, he is not working from his own will. He has no choice, and allowed to work. But if he was to switch, wouldn't he be considered at least somewhat working on his own initiative from his own will? Could he still be considered anus that he had no choice? Rabbi Yoshri, as I mentioned earlier, ruled that he was definitely forced to work in one or the other, and therefore he was not doing anything from his own will, and he was allowed to switch. In conclusion, what can we learn from all these cases presented above regarding hiding children, 
kashrus, kosher food, and Shabbos, which are just a drop in the bucket from numerous questions on various issues which appear in the response to literature from the Holocaust period. During the Holocaust, the Jews were in an intensifying level of danger from pre-war Nazi Germany to the ghettos to the concentration, labor, and extermination camps. In each one of these situations, there were Jews who turned to the Rabbanim, to the rabbis, yes, their guidance on various practical matters. We discussed cases from all stages. Shechita, the slaughtering of the animals in pre-war Germany, opening stores on Shabbos at early stages of the war, smuggling children out of the ghettos, hiding them by non-Jews, and eating non-kosher in the camps. Although knowing the basic ruling that in case of danger, one is exempt from keeping the vast majority of mitzvahs, of commandments, even in the most difficult situations, they did not feel excluded from observing the commandments. They felt that Dvar Hashem, God's word, was as relevant as ever. They sought to hear rabbinical guidance. They turned to the rabbis in day-by-day -day situations as in life and death matters. They showed amazing devotion and made every effort to observe the commandments on the highest possible level. That can be considered, in a term used in learning, lechatchila, in the most tragic living conditions they were forced into with the Avad in reality. The Jewish head, which succeeds to focus in the midst of the most extreme slave labor conditions and ask the questions, combined with the Jewish soul, which resists and overcomes the instinct and temptation such as in the case described regarding the non kosher food. The starvation rations are symbols of greatness and a source of inspiration. Thank you. Wow. A wonderful crowd. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I didn't oh, think yeah. the stamp was wrong. Oh. Yeah. Thank you for inviting yes. me. I'm going to make some good I think we have, we have a minute. Do you have a minion? Do you have a minion for who, who can say for who's signing right away, Myron? Gorgie, can you can say for 10 minutes? Good, good, good. Good, good. What? I mean, it's not, not a lot, but... Yeah, yeah, we'll turn it off, yeah. How do we turn it off by... Did you set up the camera? I did. You zoomed in too much. No, 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 it's good, it's good. You can, you can, oh, tap. You'll see it. Okay. You can always adjust. How do we close it? That's the main thing. Uh, um, I, I, yeah. I am going to have to edit it for YouTube. <laughs> Why? Oh, is it? Wait, so how do we turn it off? Let's see. Uh, well, start stop.